that was an extremely potent film, for lack of a better word, extremely powerful. Went straight to the gut. Um, in terms of the voices that were heard over the course of your movie, uh, your film, one significant silence came from the part of the perpetrators themselves. I was wondering if you managed to um, have conversations with any of the writers, just to get a sense of the kind of fever that they went through, um, their motivations. Did they have? I don't know what what went through their minds. Did they? Did they experience any remorse or any sort of regret, or did they, you know, did, eh, just just a sense of what went through their minds, basically? No, it, uh, it, that was impossible. I mean, uh, in a sense, um, as I said, when we got there, uh, I mean, we started actually with shooting the Ganesh procession, and everything exploded right as you see in front of your eyes, you know. And after that, we just kept going back every day into the old city. It was under curfew, but we travel around. And um, it was, you know, the thing with perpetrators is they're not really, it's in the crowd, it's not as if you can pinpoint or grab someone to talk to. That's not possible. And in areas where the perpetrators were walking around freely, like, you know, like, People say, you know, they're threatening us and this and that. Um, there, actually, to go and talk to them would have been, in a sense, um, extremely dangerous at that time. Because they know very well what they have done. No? And you're coming with a camera and saying, well, we've heard that you destroyed this house or that you killed so-and-so. I mean, it's, it would have been impossible to do that kind of thing. It would have been very difficult. That's why, I mean, the, I tried uh, uh, talking to the two part, the guys, both the political leaders who were really behind it, actually. They were, there's no point catching these little fellows who are paid, you know, bought for hire kind of thing. It's, so I tried at least with them, um, you know, but even with them, you can't say directly uh, you know, you have to go around it, like, you know, who, wh why do you think riots happen, et cetera, et cetera. Because that, there is always, every documentary filmmaker, you don't want to be kicked out, no? That's the end of the interview. You have to keep the conversation going somehow. So you have to do that. That, that is um, the, yeah. I have many questions, but maybe I'll ask mm. one and then wait. Uh, when you when you were introducing the film, mm. um, you said the film got lost, mm. and then it came back, right? Um, if you could speak about that, and also um, many thoughts going through my mind while I was watching the film. But as somebody watching the film today, um, as a, as a as a testimony of the times, but if you will also to look at it as a cinematic text and a film that, and you made the film. Mm. Not how does it feel, but how, how do you read this film today? I mean, there are two questions, but... Mm. It's, um... Okay, so this film, we, we filmed in 1984, and the film was ready in 1986, and we had uh, countless screenings in India. I mean, this film has really um, traveled at that time. And you have to remember, it was a time uh, where we had VHS cassettes, I don't know if any of you remember them, VHS cassettes, VHS recorders, 16mm prints, all such outdated technology now. But that's how the film traveled, and it was screened in many, many places all over the country. And in uh, 86, uh, um, uh, no, actually, I think it was 88, it went to the Berlin Film Festival. And at that, uh, the practice there was that they would keep a print which would have German subtitles. We'd have to give them a print with German subtitles. And uh, we forgot that the print was there. Now, meanwhile, the prints that we had, because they were screened and screened and screened, they started looking like mosquito net, uh, you know, they're so in such bad condition. And we really didn't have the money to make another print or to do a proper telecine or, you know, now the, it, the prices are so low that these things are possible. Uh, and what happened is that uh, there was, um, well, many people in Jamia, for example, like uh, Rakesh Sharma and Sabha and Rahul Diwan and people like this have told me later that uh, 
you know, we saw the film, we saw this film in, in Jamia while they were students and it affected them profoundly. And Rakesh Sharma, in fact, said that his work with making films on uh, the politics of hate really started when he watched this. So it, that generation has seen it, you know, people today who are like in their maybe what, late 40s, right? Then the film disappeared and people would ask me for it and I said, you know, all I have is this terrible uh, print. Then there was a German researcher called uh, Nicole Wolf, and she was researching Indian documentary. And everywhere she went, she heard about this. A lot of people spoke about it, and she came to me and said, but it's so mysterious. It's like, where is it, <laughs> you know? And again, I was so embarrassed. I said, I'm very sorry. I really can't. I can describe it to you, but you really can't see it, which is so peculiar if you think about it. And then what happened was in the Arsenal, which is um, affiliated with the Berlin Berlin Film Festival, um, they decided to open up their archives to 40 people. They could be filmmakers, they could be film historians, they could be artists. And uh, they called it the Living Archive Project. And they said, you can come in here and you can go through our archives and pick whatever you want and curate a program around it. So Nicole, she just decided to go through it. And I still remember the day she ring me. I mean, she's screaming from Berlin. She says, Deepa, I found it. And I couldn't believe it. And you know, with German subtitles, and the film was there in very good condition, this print was. So this process, then she decided that her part of the Living Archive project would be really to restore the film. And I'm so grateful and I have to thank her and Arsenal and the Berlinale because without, and the Goethe Institute, because without them, this restoration would not have taken place. And then started this hunt for the negative. And uh, I must say we did it through the Kanadiga network because it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have found the negative otherwise because in all the Bombay labs, you have a very strong group of bunts, you know, from Mangalore and Udupi who have worked in AdLab, they have worked in Modern 16, they've worked in Reliance. It's a kind of gang, you know, they're, they're everywhere. So once we, one guy, and because the lab had been sold for three times. And finally we located, this, that was another search in and of itself, you know. And the person who, the, our sound recordist, Mr. G. V. Somshekar, who actually did it, and he called it Mission Impossible, you know, it's like, and the sad thing is, you know, our own historical sort of consciousness is so bad. You know, we don't archive properly. We don't keep our materials. You should have seen the conditions in the lab. I mean, the fact that this print that you see, even as much as you do, is something that is miraculous, you know, the, the restoration itself. So then the negative was found. Then we redid the audio track from as much as we could. And yeah, so it was a huge, even technical job and um, has come back. Now, your second question as to, um, it's very strange, you know, how, how, how do you describe it? You know, it's like, uh, it's like looking at yourself 30 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, I mean, it's a very peculiar thing to look at it. Because you look and you say, who was that person? You know, uh, some things in that person like the anger, for example. For example, this poem at the end. Uh, today, I would never use a poem like that. It would be unthinkable for me. But at that time, I think the, the, the kind of anger and the kind of, um, you know, but day after day, we were watching people go through terrible things. You know? So it, it's really, you look back and you think, okay, so what was your understanding of issues at the time? What was your political understanding? What were your kind of, um, how were you framing this question? It's really looking at an, a younger version, <laughs> different version of yourself. I can't explain, I mean, you're all so young, you still have a, um, you know, I, I don't know if you've been in a place where you've reflected on something you did even 10 years ago, you reread something, an article, something that you did. It, it was that kind of feeling, right? But I think the most profound thing for me, looking at it was thinking, uh, you know, you are in a historical moment and you don't understand it. That happened for me. Because I said, you know, in 84, it was all there, okay? They hadn't named it as a Hindutva project. They hadn't given it a category. It hadn't become a theoretical category. It hadn't become 
a political category. It hadn't become a public category, but everything was in place. You know, the language was in place, the kind of uh, using uh, religious um, icons. Of course, they switched to Ram, but if you look at, uh, if you look at the Murtis, I mean, Ganesh with a bow and arrow, where have you ever seen that? This very militaristic, uh, you know, iconography that was there. Tearing the, chest. Ah, tearing the chest open, you know, all these things were there. And I thought, yeah, in, uh, you know, in 1992, they brought Babri Masjid down. I mean, it was, didn't take that long. So it's impossible to be in a historical moment and understand it all. Of course, that's impossible. But when I looked at it and I thought, yes, you, you, I mean, for people who study history or whatever, you can see it. It's uh, very uh, much all there. The only thing I would say is that uh, later, you know, when you look at, okay, Ram Ke Naam comes out in 82. If you, even if you look at film history and see the films that were being made on communal violence, I think this is one of the first, which... Um, basically also analyzes a riot, you know. We, we tried something here, which is to say that these things are politically motivated. Uh, people don't just get up and start uh, killing each other. There's nothing, um, you know, inherently that people are bestial or people are, have this kind of rage, that it is politically motivated, trying to understand that, trying to understand curfew also, and the impact of curfew. I think this is also something that um, and how painful it is and how, uh, how you, if you use it as governance, the kind of structural violence it imposes on people. So I think there were a lot of things here that were very different. By the time you have Ram Kinam, which is again about, uh, say, eight or nine years after this film, there, you see, the imperative of the, of the hour was to really take on Hindutva as ideology. That became, you know, and the whole Babri Masjid, I mean, question. So it had sh shifted by then, you know, and then you have, after that, you had one more film, I think, that Anand made on, uh, what is it, Man Something in Holy War, Father, Son and Holy War, that was another one. And then in 2002, after 2002, you have Rakesh Sharma talking about the final solution. But all these, I think, were already engaging with what I call the Hindutva project, in, in which was in full force at that time, and you had to frontally engage with it. So... Yeah. If you look at Hyderabad, the context is that the majlis is also as communal as BJP is. So, but the confrontation which happened in Ahmedabad or confrontation which happened in UP was at a very different level. So, so one is that, uh, that that's something which was coming constantly to my mind and looking at communist flags and BJP flags together. So that was pretty amazing to see. And... <laughs> So, and another question which I see now, now you, again you have Hyderabad, there is Metro coming, there is, there is TRS coalition with Majlis happening or Congress coming into existence. How do you see the political space in the old city? What is the status now when you say from, say from looking from 1980s to now, what is, how do you see that space? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. I think uh, the, um, see, even if there are uh, Muslim communal forces, I think later, at least in film, what I see is that there is a sort of, you don't want to go there. I mean, there, there are forces. I'm not saying that there are no forces. But in this film, we really did want to talk about the majlis and not just talk about this immediate history, but, this, but really that it started in the 40s, that you have to contextualize it from the 40s, right? What is happening today, now the interesting thing is that once uh, the TDP came back to power, once uh, NTR came back to power, we didn't have riots. And the thing is that the administration, if they don't want riots to happen, can make them not happen. It's very simple. So we just did not have riots. You know, it just, uh, it was a very clear signal to the police and to, so that has changed. But what has happened, um, the big shift I feel with the Muslim community in Hyderabad today is this targeting by state authorities for any, if there is a bomb blast, okay? Uh, you know, bomb blast takes place at 3.20 in the afternoon. At eight o'clock at night, all our uh, TV anchors who are all shooting themselves in the foot, immediately say it is Simi, Indian Mujahideen, blah, blah, blah. I mean, how, how is this credible? 
Tell me, okay? Has there been a forensic investigation? Nothing. I mean, which investigative agency in the world is going to tell you in five hours who did it? Right? So this kind of systematic targeting, you know, by the media, by police, who just pick up Muslim youth. You know? uh, and twice this has happened in Hyderabad, that uh, in one case there were 18 uh, boys who were picked up and third degree torture, everything. And because of civil society groups and the pressure that they put on them, they were released after nine months with all charges dropped. So the Muslim community today, it's not this kind of communal politics, you see. But there's a great sense of fear and um, it's under siege. I mean, they feel beleaguered, you know. It's, uh, the minute anything happens, the kind of tension and uh, because they know this is going to happen. They're just going to get... Uh, so that's a shift, you see. I think that shift has taken place. The other thing in Hyderabad is that, you know, Muslims are uh, active in political life. Like if you look at the Telangana uh, statehood issue, I mean, there's a whole bunch of Muslims for Telangana, you know. They want to be part of normal politics, not just communal politics. I think this is also a big difference, you know. And I put this down to the fact that um, in, in AP, and definitely in Telangana, the influence of the left, of left politics is huge. So these kind of groups, for example, Muslims for Telangana or... Uh, you know, they have started these joint action committee groups. That's how they mobilize people for the alternates, I mean, for the Telangana state struggle. And they, Muslims have been part of all these initiatives, right? So that is the kind of climate there now. I mean, the majlis, okay, apart from the old city, it's true, they can't really win anywhere. And it's very interesting that when this film was being restored, uh, Sultan Salahuddin Oasi's youngest son was arrested for the first time for hate speech. Akbaruddin Oasi, right? The fact is that they can't really expand a little bit. They want to get into rural Telangana as well, um, you know, but they can't really make that shift out there. And basically, that rhetoric isn't working. I mean, today, if you speak to young people in the old city, they want to be in mainstream and they, they are not, they want to get into IT, they want to, they are not interested in this old politics, you know. For them, I showed it, actually, my, one of the first screenings, I took it and showed it to young people, and uh, it was very interesting because they, they were shocked, because they said, you know, this is what our parents used to speak about, this, this is like their memories, etc. And uh, then they gave me a cautionary tale, they said, but you know, you should be careful, because um, people will read things into it as they choose. And I thought that hasn't changed even in, the, in whatever, 28 years or whatever. Because when we first showed the film, everybody would be sitting there doing arithmetic. You know, how many human bodies, how many uh, Muslim victims, how many. And they'd ask me like that. You showed only three, um, I mean, four Hindu victims and you've shown like uh, five Muslim victims. Like, you know, this arithmetic, you know, some kind of... Uh, and when I asked these boys, why will there be trouble? They said, yeah, because people will read. They will only see that part. No? And, the, and what is very fascinating is that uh, Oasis' son, I went and heard his speech, not just the little bit that was objectionable, but they are appealing. He is using the same language, you know, appealing to this sense of dispossession that you have been, you know, once we were all Nawabs, we had X and we had Y. Everybody was not a Nawab, excuse me. Even then, they couldn't have been. It was a very feudal, brutal state. You know, the revenue collection was so brutal. The Telangana peasant arm struggle happened there because of the brutality of both Muslim and Hindu zamindars. So, but this appeal, you know, that you've been dispossessed, we were somebody, this was our status, same language, he's still using it. But I don't think the young people today are buying it. This is, no, it's not happening. Uh, thank you. Uh, given these shifts that you just mentioned, uh, how, has, how do you feel the experience for the filmmaker has changed? Has it become more difficult to map these changes? Is it, is it easier? I just wanted to know. See, today, I think, uh, you know, in those days, we were extremely 
uh, there was no other camera present. Can you imagine a situation like that? There was only this one shot of the cops in the Ganesh procession. That was the one camera. The cops were shooting everything apart from us. And then when the NTR, when his, uh, he comes back, then you had, um, I think there was BBC and Doordarshan. That was it, right? So very different time to film. Hmm? Today, I think because of all these channels and, uh, and people have visual literacy, they have a much better sense of how they're going to be perceived. There's also a performative aspect in front of cameras, what I feel now. Um, so I think it's changed completely how you, uh, to work today is tougher. I think it's, it's tougher in one sense, or you have to be, I don't know, I, I think it's very hard now to, for people to know who you are, you know, how do you get a, um, and all these stings and scams and, you know, sting camera scams and all, people are so visually sharp no? now they, in fact they ask you i noticed the other day like which channel and then they'll deign to talk to you if they're from a channel that they think is low status they'll move on <laughs> you know it's very interesting now really somebody should do something on that this whole uh, intrusion of these cameras and the performative aspect that you see on news today it's it is performance you know of a sort um, so yeah i think it's so I think the challenge for documentary filmmakers really is uh, how do you make something that is not TV? <laughs> that is the challenge. Because if we say that the currency we have, if you look at it, whether it's the interview or the formal currency I'm talking about, whether it's the interview or whether you're, uh, you know, I don't know, shooting a riot or you're in somebody's home or whatever, what are you going to do to give people a, a, a much more profound understanding of what's going on, uh, and which is not TV? And I think that's a, that's a challenge for all of us. It really is a challenge. Yeah. No, but I'll tell you, this is his best work. Huh? I mean, it is so stunning. It's like, you. firstly, it's a 16mm camera, which is very heavy, very heavy. The lens is, is huge, and they're only 10-minute rolls. Today, in this digital world, we forget because people film for hours. You can film for hours without changing anything. Well, not hours, but you can film for whatever. I mean, at least an hour, okay? So you had this 10 minute, uh, you know, you shoot for 10 minutes, then you literally have to reload a new magazine, which takes two minutes, you take it off, put it on again. And the thing is that, um, you know, you, it's also about composing something under stress. If this is not just random footage, it's like so extraordinary that he can, even under a very stressful thing, can actually compose something. So, you know, the light, the, the, and also it's a very tender camera, no? I think it's very empathetic and even when you're with people and they're telling you terrible things, you still feel, you don't feel, I, I don't know what you feel, I didn't feel that we were, um, I don't know, like voyeuristic or anything. It was, it was a moment where, you know, the, the, what they were saying and how we, it was being filmed, we were both resting in some place which was a bit still and not, uh, I, I don't know, I shouldn't be saying oh, this is what I think anyway. But you know the curfew sequence, for example, you know, when you were there inside and they're just cooking and they're just sitting around and I mean, that's one of my favorite uh, parts of the film where, and again, you don't see that in the films later about the communal situation that, you know, how do people just live, no? And also as filmmakers that uh, we chose to stay there during curfew. It's not just in out that you go in just for the riots, get a few sound bites and rush out, no. We stayed there and that meant uh, we could be, have been attacked too. 
So you share the danger as well. It's not just that you're going for footage, no? So I think there are some things here which um, we tried to do, which were, because the curfew really affected us, you know, because it's horrible for people, especially daily wage people. They were really starving. And how do you communicate that uh, quality, you know, while all this mayhem is going around and all this political nonsense? And, you know, hundreds and thousands of people are just waiting for it to end. So these kind of things, like how do you, so it's not just reportage, you know, can you construct something that's a little more than reportage? Can you, um, yeah. But as I was telling Subhashri, I just wish I had more uh, filmmaking smarts at that time because I wasn't very experienced as a filmmaker and the material was so great and I think I would have edited it very differently, you know. With, if, but it's a moment of its time. It marks not only that historical moment, it marks where we were also in our understanding and our capacity. Yeah. Uh, I, I still I can I can't believe it, it was made in eighty four, like the cuts were so smooth and all. So my question is, uh, uh, did you experience any conflict uh, as a, a filmmaker in you and a human in you? especially the shots where uh, the people were stabbed and taken into hospital. So like, I was uh, imagining myself, if I was there, like, I won't be able to shoot them. You know, like, uh, it was so, uh, so what was your feeling at that moment? Like, I don't want to shoot it or like, what, what do you thought about it? See, I think the thing is that, you know, cameramen are luckier because they have the camera. There's a little distance. And somehow when you're looking through the lens, the challenges of uh, taking the shot also give you a little distance. It was harder for me because I was um, the person, uh, you know, closer to people. Just to say, yeah, it was very difficult. I mean, on all levels, it was a very difficult film. Uh, you know, we, uh, I got a curfew pass for one day from the police and they put a date on it, you know. So every day I'd rub it out and uh, change the date. Because you couldn't get a curfew pass to go back again. So 22 days, by the time there's a hole, you know, I couldn't wrap it out anymore. So you had to put your hand on the pass and wave it at these cops. And then we had this blue van. Uh, we had, the van we hired for the shoot was an old uh, police van. And that guy was too poor to repaint it. I don't know if you remember. In those days, those vans were blue. Yeah. So luckily, we could get into these areas, right? And I remember this place where these people, this hospital thing. So every day we would go in and, um, you know, there was, you were sort of, that adrenaline was working, you know. We didn't know what this film would be about, actually, really. We just said, we just have to go and shoot. Things are happening everywhere. Let's just go and find out what's going on. And that day when this happened, we went to this place and I got out and I said, you know, this is scary. You get a peculiar sixth sense, no? You feel, okay, today, no, this is weird. It was completely silent, closed. Those are the shots that the film begins with. You know, the man looking over the wall, the woman closing the door, the woman peeping, that area. And I remember saying, we have to leave now. And uh, Navroz and the sound guy had jumped out already and they were shooting. And I remember Navroz and I, uh, he's my husband also, yeah. So we were standing in the street and having a f domestic and professional fight where he says, if you didn't have the guts to make this film, what are you doing here? We can't leave now. And I said, I don't care. I, this is dangerous. I am telling you, this is creepy. Let's get out. We're, we're having this fight, okay, publicly on the road. And finally, so I said, I don't care. We're leaving. And uh, it's the only time I did it. I said, Boss, I'm the director of this film, okay? I pull rank. You're getting into this van now. We're leaving now. And you know what? We left, I tell you. And we got out. And as we were driving out, we saw these cars coming from the same place, okay, where they had been attacked. So, okay, that's a sense where you get of your own personal safety. That's one thing. But I think for me, what was very painful is... Um, just these, 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 uh, you know, the way people were killed. Yeah. I mean, you know, even a knife was merciful. You know? They used whatever they had. 
whether they were stones, whether any kind of implement. How do people deal with that loss, no? And and what are you doing there? You know, at at one point. And after that, the the, the Muslim man, you know, who speaks about uh, his uh, his son-in-law being killed, and uh, that was just so terrible. And and you know, and, and that's when I said, look, this is we have to stop shooting now because this is ridiculous. You know, what are we doing? I mean, we just have to stop. And it was very hard. I think uh, working, editing. And yet, you know, when you edit, you putting in that material. And then I thought, okay, is this too much, you know? But then you think, um, how do you communicate to people really what goes on? No? Because people in the new city, where there is never any curfew, they never know what it's about, no? what life like that is. Because it's just sealed off, no? that area is sealed off, you never get an idea. These are tough decisions, yeah? Every filmmaker has to take them. What footage do you keep in? What do you take out? How do you contextualize it? It's all difficult. It's not um, easy. I mean, the, the shot that really is horrible for me, you know, when I looked at it again, was, you know, when the Muslim man is speaking and, uh, oh, it's such a terrible shot. And we cut to the blood on the floor. That was totally unnecessary. We need not have cut to that. I mean, somewhere I think, that's what I mean, you know, you, you, you look at that, when I look at myself then and I say, who is this person, you know, why were you doing that then? Yeah, it's a, it's a different, um, because this poem, you know, Sarveshwar Dayal Saxena is a Marxist poet, a very well-known Marxist poet. Um, so it seemed something that uh, spoke, you know, to what we were feeling. But today, what is very creepy is that I've been to meetings where I hear, uh, say, um, both on the Hindu and Muslim side, this kind of rhetoric in public meetings. You know, hatyari ko mat ka, maaf mat karo. This, this language, and it uh, is scary. You know, how language can be appropriated, how it can be used today, you know, many things like that. Hmm. No, not really, because uh, the Hyderabad Ekta group that was already working in the old city, and they were screening it, in a sense. What used to happen in screenings was very interesting, because uh, uh, we, by this, you know, the city is now very polarized, even in those days. That's why I put that reference into land and all that, because a lot of it was about land, and evicting people, and, and clearing uh, you know, giving the real estate guys an in into the old city to get land. So you have uh, Hindus and Muslims now, they don't really live together. So the screenings we had were often turned with Muslims or with Hindus separately. And those were very moving, you know. In the old city, the screenings were very moving because I remember, uh, ah, one more thing I have to tell you, that when I was shooting, this is also very important, so I never wear a bindi, you know. But uh, in this film, every day, I wore a sari and I wore a bindi because I didn't want anybody to not know who I was, I mean, I mean, which community I belonged to. And I think this is also there, you know, as a filmmaker, like, you, it's a conversation. You're not just interviewing people. They are free to interrogate you, you know. And uh, there was one woman, you know, she told me, you know, she said, uh, after this Ganesh thing, she said, Kaise shaitan jaise ida hai ma aapke, she said. You know, your festivals are like, shaitan is what devil, no? Like, evil. So what kind of festivals do you Hindus have, you know? They're so evil. Like, because after each Ganesh procession, Muslims would be killed. So she just saw it like that, you know? Mm. And then we had to have this conversation, right? So, yeah, it's a, um, I don't know, it's a tricky thing. How do you... So, in the screenings, I remember, for example, Muslims would be very shocked. Ke, achha, unke bhi hua. 
you know, and I'd get the same reaction on the other side, that we didn't know that they had also lost uh, people or that their homes were damaged. But you know, when you come to the new city and you talk to, say, middle class or people who are unaffected or whatever, they start doing all this body arithmetic. Isn't that interesting? Not in the old city. The old city, it was a very visceral thing that, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know that this had happened or this can happen. Or, so it was interesting for me. Yeah. But the thing is that uh, Narendra, he's a um, smart cookie. He's the only one who every now and then told me, ye off the record hai and ye mat lagana and all that, which I never listened to, by the way. But finally, I went and showed it to him. And he said, uh, kisi ko mat batana. <laughs> That's all he said. That's a shameless, cynical fellow, you know. I mean, he, see, they were so confident in their politics. Yeah, what? This is a little film. What is it going to be? But he just laughed and he said, kisi ko mat batana. But uh, OVC, I sent the tape. I never heard, never heard back from him. But, uh, but see, this is also important. I think you should share it with these guys. And, and the perpetrator story no, that you're talking about, I think you can do something with perpetrators not at the time. You can go back uh, later and uh, try, you know. But um, I don't know what that, con I'm, I really don't know what that conversation, how to have that conversation. Um, but people have done it. I think in Father, Son and Holy War, I think Anand has a scene where you have these Shiv Sena boys casually talking about the things they've done. No remorse. Hmm. Yeah, boys in the uh, hood. No? They want to change it to Bhagyanagar. No, no, this is a BJP thing to change the name of Hyderabad itself. That's been a huge program of theirs, which they haven't succeeded. Not Bhagmati, no, not Bhagmati. Bhagya Lakshmi, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much.